about 10 episodes of Hawaii Five Oak through the years. Mr. Feinberg? Uh, I'm Ronald Feinberg. Uh, uh, I did the sixth show, and then over the years I did two more. Guest star. <laughs> maybe, maybe you want to explain what it was like to be a guest star in Hawaii Five Oak at that time. Well, um, the first year, the sixth show, um, what I remember were all of the animals running across the stage at the, at the uh, studio because it was in an abandoned um, sugar cane um, um, treatment plant or, or, or place. And there were no walls. Um, all that had was a roof and siding, and, and it was open everywhere. And uh, as I remember, uh, what are they called? The, the, the snake catching little rodents. Mongoose. As I remember in Hawaiian history, someone along the way decided that it was a really good idea to impart two or three mongoose. And the two or three mongoose have not turned out to be, I guess, a real problem. Uh, but what I remember all the time was the mongoose running across the floor of the, of the studio. Um, it was a. Uh, a difficult place to work. I mean, the studio was a difficult place to work. And Hawaii is a difficult place to work too on location uh, if you're doing action stuff, uh, which, which I mostly did. It's a difficult place. The first year of any series, and I've been on the first year of any number of them, it's a difficult time. It's, it, takes, uh, it takes a year to just kind of settle in modestly, and two years to get modestly comfortable, and three years to get to be a pain in the ass to the producers. <laughs> I uh, started doing some guest spots uh, when I started working away. I was working uh, my way through college, and Dad wanted me to a place where to keep an eye on me, so he got me a job working in security down on the set out of Diamond Head. And one day I walked past the office, and Bob Bush was the casting director then, walked on and said, come here. Can you read this line? I said, yeah. I said, okay, you got the part. And it was a walk on, you know, like 360 plus a quarter, 1030, and I never knew what the heck it all meant. But you walked on it, you did it, and you got paid a lot of money. And I said, this is not a bad way to live. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I graduated to several de uh, decent spots, especially one called, I believe, Steel Now Pay Later, which um, Levi Hanneman and I paid, played the hijackers. And we were running around hijacking, and ended up a big scene where uh, Steve McGarrett and the 5 team trap us in a warehouse and the SWAT team comes out and takes us into custody. Um, and that was an interesting shoot because in several of those scenes we were shooting on location. As you said, it is, it is hard to shoot on location because you have a lot of distractions in the way. In the middle of a scene, a 747 comes over and it looks like yelling cut and wait for the planes to, to pass over and, and the winds to die down and the sun comes in front of the cloud, you spend another half an hour waiting for the clouds to get back to the right direction. But what happened was that um, we were very heavily armed for one scene when we did the hijack. And we took a break and it was Bob a piece of Nephi and myself standing on the street corner. And we walked away from the set because we wanted to have some privacy. And this car came up to this intersection. And we're standing there with sawed off shotguns <laughs> and 45s. The guy looked at us and we smiled at him and he zipped right through the red light. <laughs> Next thing you know, there's a police helicopter flying over us, you know, and we're going 5 0, you know, the guy's a likely story. <laughs> but we finally got everything squared away. But shooting in Hawaii um, and what Hawaii 5 0 meant to Hawaii, um, I, I think you know, those of us who were privileged enough at that time to work on the show and also to know what it meant, because I think a lot of Hawaii's history and success can be tracked back to the efforts that were put into that show at that time in Hawaii's history. It meant a lot to tourism, to uh, Hawaii's image in the world, and it, it, it was a very special place for the people of Hawaii. You know, we didn't realize what a big thing it was back then. It was just a show. You know? uh, it was interesting for me, traveling around the islands after the show had been on, and done a couple of shows. I mean, I could not have been any more recognizable for the population than Clark Gable. I mean, I, 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 they all watched, I guess, people set their, their, their clocks by going to watch the show. And it was an interesting time to be in the islands. Uh, as a tourist, <laughs> I wore my, my fingers out <laughs> as tourists while, while traveling around uh, Maui and uh, Kauai. And, uh, the, um, the, the, 
the interesting thing, I guess, for me and maybe for you, um, is is I did the sixth show. I mean, that that's really quite early in the going, and a lot of things are genuinely unsettled. And there are lots and lots of things that are unsettled. Um, the sixth show is a particularly difficult show because size was everything in the script. The script was written by a man named John D. F. Black, who I, I was hoping would be here. Uh, he wrote several Bibles, and I was hoping he might be here. Um, and it was a, a, a script which required two large men, two very large men, two exceptionally large <laughs> men. And um, that's, that's a problem business, it's a problem. Since both of the roles were dramatic roles and not neat, um, I can best describe uh, the prospects for a six foot eight inch, uh, at that point, 275 pound man as an actor as limited. Um, what one looks at is one looks at the meat. Um, there he is, and um, yeah, we'll hire him, just set, stand him over there by the door, he'll cover up the hole in the set and you know, do a lot of other things. But I, I had been an actor then for 15 years already when I went to do the first Bible. And um, I had long since passed by a willingness to take meat roles. I wouldn't do it. It made me rather difficult. So in 1970, I think there were only 16,000 of us over 60, six foot eight in the US. We're a small minority. And so I, 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 was, I did not have a lot of competition in town. It was, and as an actor, it was, it was an interesting thing for FIBO to go out looking for a couple of actors who were really enormous. Um, the other part um, uh, was played by Denny Miller. Uh, Denny was one of the Tarzans, if you remember Tarzan. And he started on a show called Wagon Train for 10 years. as the Wagon Train leader. And um, he's now selling uh, uh, Gordon Seafood uh, on your television regularly with beard and all. And Denny, Denny went, Denny's about six foot five and a half. Well, they had to have somebody at least as big as Denny and hopefully somebody larger. And they were looking here and they came looking for me. And I arrived on the scene not knowing the director, not knowing Jack Lord, not knowing Denny Miller, uh, not knowing anyone. And Denny arrived on the scene not knowing Jack Lord, not knowing anybody else. And here are these two hunks, I mean, these enormous men. And it was, uh, on a, the sixth show, on the sixth show, on the show at that point, which I believe was very shaky in the ratings, terribly shaky, um, we were a problem. We were a problem. We were a definite problem. And uh, Pepe, Dick Benedict, who was the director of that segment, who was passed on, um, was confronted with just madness. Fortunately for us, uh, Dick was an ex boxer and had been hit enough so that. He understood it was all right to be large and physical and difficult. Um, those those days were those days were long. They were very very long. We 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 went a long long time. We were staying in the Ilikai Hotel then, which was comfortable, and uh, we would arrive back at the hotel in the limo that would take us back, a car that would take us back. We probably set the Ilikai back to Denny and I uh, at least a year. I mean, we drove, just, I mean, they couldn't believe us going across the hall. We walked up to the elevator. They have a tower at the Ilikai. And Denny and I walked up to the tower, and I was covered with a dark red volcanic dust that just coated me. They had painted my hair a little in here and painted my mustache just a little bit, as I remember. And so I had black stuff running down through the red volcanic dust on my face. Uh, Denny looked uh, worse in a different kind of way. And we walked up to the elevator and stood there, and a lady walked up and stood between us and looked over her shoulder like this and said, oh, I, I'm not going up. <laughs> I don't walk that, way. Uh, that That whole show, I couldn't get anybody to get in an elevator the whole time. Question? Uh, you know, we could go on. Just off, did, did you do an episode of Rifle in the Back of the Oh, I, I, yeah, two, uh, about 200 episodes of television, both comedy and hour long, uh, covering a long period of time, all kinds of strange stuff. Uh, just a regular on Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, for those of you who are old enough to remember. 
Uh, I've done some films as well, and uh, it's been a long time. I mean, it's been a long time. One of the highlights on that show is a fight with uh, your character in Magera. How did you block that out? Did that? Well, there, there was a part where it's throw them around. Yeah, that, that, uh, as I said, it's very difficult to watch people in England. I mean, it's really difficult. It's, it was difficult for, for me here as well, because obviously one is confronted one is larger a lot of physical action. So I had to do a good bit of it myself. But I was always doubled, and I have w had great fortune with doubles um, for a long time. Nobody's going to carry a double to Hawaii um, for uh, eight or nine days uh, to do a show. So they found a kid, I don't know, he may still be around, and he was a dear man. He had been an All-American at the University of Oklahoma. And um, I will never forget his name. This show was rather important. His name was Bob Louie. L-U-I? L-U-I, yeah. A great big, great big man. So he, he doubled it. But uh, uh, Jack and I, not knowing each other, uh, difficult situation, difficult material, uh, very violent stuff, managed to get through those scenes with a good bit of the primary stuff being done by us. Um, and I had physical action with him on other shows as well. And we managed um, because of his, I, part of it I guess was something measure of commitment to, to me as an actor, and maybe some of it to me personally, that, that I can't testify to. But it was a great <coughs> desire to have the stuff look good. Well, the best it's going to look is if they've got enough footage of him and enough footage of me in the fight uh, to make the, the really difficult things like picking me up and, and, uh, and picking him up and throwing him into, I sorry, remember I picked him up and threw him into the, into the field. Um, that was a, a stunt person. Um, but a good bit of that footage was us, uh, a lot. Because there's a lot of hand-to-hand -hand where you can't... Yeah, oh, yeah, no, it, it was us. Thing. And uh, 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 he's a man with uh, uh, physical skills. And in spite of the fact that uh, I am not the you know, the most coordinated and uh, most beautiful uh, person in the world to do this stuff, I had done it a good bit already. And so uh, you, know, you did it. And uh, there was a devotion, at least when I was there, to to offering as much, you know, really strong physical action on camera as possible. Not, not in danger. Any other questions right now? In the first show that you did, the, the big secret is that you don't have a driver's license at the end. Indeed. And in the second show, which is Little Girl Blue, you also don't have a driver's license. Was that some kind of an in-joke? <laughs> well, uh, the, the, uh, somebody asked me about that earlier today. That's not the second show. That's the third show. Um, the second show is... A, I was involved in strange stuff on that show. I mean, I, I promise you I was really involved in strange stuff. The second show is a, a show that was, I don't know what the hell it is called. It was called No Bottles, No Cans, No People. And um, it, was a, it was a script that was, I guess the garbage uh, uh, processing plant is gone. I think that's gone. But we shot in the, in the Honolulu uh, uh, garbage processing plant, which was open. And we shot in the place where some months before, two murder victims had been. I mean, this script was based on the reality of, of, of uh, crime in, in Honolulu, and we worked in the place where the bodies were found in the, in the crusher. Um, that one, I had a driver's license. But that one was, along with, I, I don't know exactly how many, but several other shows, was warranted by CBS to be too violent, and there were no reruns. So the show's only got one run on the network, and then we're not seen again until syndication, which broke my heart because the residuals didn't come for a long time and they weren't as good. But but uh, um, uh, there was nothing there was nothing uh, uh, in particular about the driver's license. It wasn't an inside gag. I, I wish I could tell you it was. But, but, but. Okay, well, in the in the, uh, the, uh, the show where you kidnap a little girl, they, yeah. used, they used a lot of footage from that show from a previous episode. It, 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 I can, I can, if you like me, I, I, geez, I have this terrible feeling one is an excruciating bore. So if those people who are bored will raise their hands and there are two or three, I'll just <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, television, television is a strange animal. Over the years, I, I've had both the terrible duty and privilege of replacing outstanding actors' voices in their last work. 
um, when they were dead. Um, you can imagine what kind of a burden it is in terms of responsibility. It's, it's a terrible thing, particularly something you might know. And what, what, what can happen is, in, in terms of the work, their voice is not strong enough. Um, they've come back and decided that they want to lose some stuff and replace the dialogue slightly. And they don't have them. They're not there. And they're going to release the picture. And it's a, it's a really substantial responsibility. And, and the complexity of what happens with individual television shows over periods of time is brutal. The, the show that was uh, Little Girl Blue was what is called in the business a bottle, a bottle show. I don't know if they still call it a bottle show or not, but it was a bottle show. And what it means is you take footage from another segment and you use it in yet another segment. Well, the initial show in the gun turret with a madman, which what that was, which was also ruled by CBS uh, to be too violent and pulled with no reruns in prime time. Um, they had this incredible footage, helicopter shots, the, uh, all of this stuff, and they loved this stuff. My agent got a call um, from uh, Leonard Freeman person asking if I would commit to doing uh, another five -over. And uh, my loyalty was unbounded. You know, I would have done anything he asked. He offered me opportunity, and, and I was uh, rather more than more than modestly devoted. Uh, and I said, he said, yes. He said, well, but we can't tell you anything beyond the fact that we need to know that you're willing to do it. Um, and that you will commit to do it when we do it. Because we're going to write the script uh, particularly for you. And if we don't get you to do this, then we're not going to rewrite the script to do this show. And that was about three months before, four months before. So I committed, and I, t and I told the agent, the agent was really irritated, because you, you know, never knew when the job was going to come, so uh, it was going to cost me something, undoubtedly, with, you know, working another show. But we did it, but that show was the, was the bottle show. They used, they planned to use about 20 minutes of footage from the other show. Yeah, that's what we Yeah, uh, 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 and it was wonderful footage, and it was just incredible helicopter uh, stuff. But, um, <coughs> Great fortune, once again for me, great fortune for the show, but particularly great fortune for me. The co-star with me was Jackie Coogan. And that is holding on to motion picture history in your hands in the warmest kind of way from one of the real, you know, incredible talents and incredibly uh, hallmark characters <coughs> in the history of the business. I mean, the kid is still the kid. We, we spent almost nine days together because we did all the work we did, we did with ourselves and a kid. We didn't do much with anybody, anything else. So when, when we weren't working, we were at the hotel. You know? So we had dinner together, we had breakfast together. It was an incredible bonus for me, incredible treat. You know, motion picture history, American history, all of this. Was, was this yeah. But that bottled show um, ended up not being rerun. And my bottles, no bottles, no cans of people ended up not being rerun. And the first show I did, all of the burning cane field sequences were used and reused and reused on the show for the entire time it was there. So you do it. But the, re the, the, the bottom answer is they couldn't rerun it. They wanted to use the footage. So they built the show. They built the show for, for me and for, for Coogan uh, to do it, using the footage. I must say, I was reasonably proud because I knew they were going to use about 20 minutes of the footage, and it ended up closer to 12. So we probably did pretty good, too, you know, something like that. One thing I did want to say is that uh, those of us in the islands owed a lot to the people at Mr. Feinberg and OA 5 0 Because when 5 0 first came in there, we didn't have an acting corps right. of actors who were you know, prepared to perform in front of television. Uh, if you had any background in Hawaii, it was on theater, on stage which is a lot of emoting and, and projecting. And one of the things we did, those of us who were lucky to appear on the show, is we watched them. And that's how we learned it. You know, we learned on the set. You watch the actors. Back when Dad used to tell me, you got, you're here, you're working this week. And I would say, yeah. And he said, well, know your lines, know your mark, know your character, listen to the director, watch the other actors. That's how you learn. Yeah. 
and, and so I, I personally want to thank Ron here for, for what they've contributed to OI5, OI and to the Acting Corps, because I think for years afterwards, you saw the same faces that had appeared in Five were appearing in the other shows. There was a core there that was developed by Jack, by people like yourself, that began to carry a Hawaii persona into the acting industry, and that we were very fortunate. And when, when, when we were there, um, um, people would talk to me, you know, um, um, that were obviously working on the show, and it, and, and um, uh, it, it was a, a, a most agreeable kind of, most agreeable kind of situation. I had a question a lot. Some things have been said about uh, Jack's uh, quote-unquote tyrannical uh, stance on the show. Uh, I wonder if you care to comment on your relationship with Jack and what you observe in terms of Jack's uh, presence. You want to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack, Dad would always say, if you're working with Jack, know your lines, be ready, be a professional. That's the key. You do that, you have no problems with Jack. And then that, that's what I found. When working with Jack, if you did your homework, and you were prepared with your character, and you went on and did your lines, you had no problems. You shot the scene and wanted to take And that was fine. It's when you didn't come prepared that I think... Um, and some people had problems. Well, first of all, I worked with a lot of number, a lot of number ones, and particularly, it's tough in half hours, very tough in half hours. But it's remarkably difficult in hour-long shows to be a number one. It really is. You set the tenor for what happens. You set the style. Uh, you set the the uh, uh, attitudes. You, you do a lot of you do a lot of things, but the show turns on you, um, and you can look at any you know particularly favorite hour long or, or half hour show that you've looked at. Now the most successful ones have had strong number ones, uh, very strong number ones. Uh, Gunsmoke is a great example. Mission Impossible is another, another example. All in the Family is, a, is a, another really good example. The person sitting in that number one position on that show is is critical, I mean, really critical. Um, I said to someone earlier today, what Mr. Lord was interested in and what was there and what was, I think, key for him was what I would describe as decorum. The operation of the set the work of the players, uh, promptness, discipline, time, um, and commitment. It was critical. It was a critical item. Peter Graves was another person on Mission Impossible who set the tenor for everything that happened year after year after year. He was the example, and what you tried to do was measure up to him. It wasn't that there weren't other good actors on it, but he was number one. He was getting more money than anybody else, which marks you as number one, as Mr. Lord was getting more money than anybody else was getting. And uh, Carol O'Connor was getting a hell of a lot more money than anybody, anybody else was getting. So you're looked up to. And uh, what, it comes down, what it comes down to is if you think about a company and crew of 65 or 70 people, you think about working 12 and 14 and occasionally 16 and 18 hour days, day after day, and in Honolulu, a distant location, it was a six-day work week, not a five-day work week. So you only have one breathing day. Um, what happens is dependent upon the attitudes and the discipline of the number one. Uh, I would say that the other word I might use to describe, that he was theatrically conservative. In other words, Jack was a, a, an actor from the stage, from the theater, York, and the theater carries its disciplines. That means rehearsal time. It means being prepared. It means being there at half hour. It means uh, devoting yourself in a, in a kind of exclusive way. Um, difficult for me? Never. But I didn't see everything. It might have been difficult for somebody else. But what for me was most important was commitment to decor. And I must say, in an absolute kind of way. Is it true that Jack Talent was offered the spot as the Garrett before Jack Lord? The, the, only, the only thing I can tell you, and I don't know how many people in, in, the, in the world know this, um, and it's not a secret. Um, the man originally 
hired for this show. Do you know who that was? I heard Robert Stack. No. Richard Boone. No. The man who originally hired for this was a gentleman named Robert Brown. And he didn't do the show. Um, I, I have every reason to believe that that's, that story is so. Um, and I don't know why. I have no idea why. But in terms of who it might have been offered to, Lord, Lord was the one they offered it to. <laughs> and Lord, Lord was the one that did it. <laughs> The show that preceded this for, for Jack, the Western the rodeo, rodeo show, it's a great curiosity in this town. Um, it was produced by an old friend who died this year, was one of the primary producers. And, geez, it went getting boring for Christ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a gentleman named Bar, Bob Barbash, who, uh, uh, who worked with Jack on that show. And the show was canceled. The numbers were very good. Um, and the show was canceled. The following year, this hasn't ever happened in LA before. The following year, the show was bought in syndication on Channel 5 or 9, one or the other, 5, 9, or 11 here in LA. Um, the show was put on in syndication and beat the, I think they were on at 8 o'clock, beat the 8 o'clock shows on the network in the Nielsen in LA. Uh, that's unheard of. I mean, reruns uh, off the network. Uh, Fox is still trying to do that, you know, but I mean, now they're trying to do it. Um, so it, it, there was a lot to offer. <coughs> a lot to offer. But I'm sure they must have offered it probably, uh, uh, you know, the first, there was a time when the first choice was, if you were going to do a, um, uh, an hour-long series, you offered it to Paul Newman. I mean, that's what you did. You know he wasn't going to do it. <laughs> but what you said to the casting director, see if you could get me Paul Newman. And the casting director would say, yes, sir. And then not do anything <laughs> because you weren't going to get Paul Newman. Then the, the second the second choice would be the next leading motion picture, you know, leading actor. Uh, people get offered a lot of sh shows. There's an A list. There's a B list. There's a C list. Uh, my first job on the show, they had tried to hire somebody else, and uh, they wouldn't do it. So I got. It. I have no pride. But <laughs> How do you go about preparing? The, going back to the first show, I think the thing that makes that work really is the Benny Appa character. I mean, how did you sort of like prepare to, to play someone who obviously you know, had developmentally challenged, whatever you want to call it? Because they, I, he's a sympathetic character, and it's sort of the key to making it work. Do you want to <laughs> <laughs> um, Well. Once again, anybody bored? But I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the whole thing. I'll, I'll tell you the whole damn thing. And I hope it won't do too long. I'm sitting at home. I lived in Hollywood. Then. The phone rang. My agent called and said, "Can you get over to CBS Radford, which is over on Ventura, of Ventura Boulevard?" I said, "Yeah. What is it?" He said, um, "It's five uh, uh, they're, they're looking for somebody there, but you've got to be there in an hour." And I said, yeah, well, I can get there right now. And that was about 11 o'clock. And I got there at noontime. And Al Honorado was the casting director. I walked in, I sat down, and I read for him, Benny. And I looked across the table at him after I'd finished reading. He didn't say anything. He didn't say a word. We just sat there staring at each other. And he said, uh, and when he said, ah, uh, I knew they'd hired somebody else. <laughs> you, you know, you have instincts, you've been around for a while, you really know what's happening. And I knew he'd hired somebody else, for sure. He said, look, um, can you go home now, it's about 12.30, can you go home and stay there till 4 o'clock? And I said, what? He said, can you go home and stay by the phone until 4 o'clock? I said, yeah, sure. Um, he said, now, if you don't hear from me about 4 o'clock, you're free to do anything you want. <laughs> so I drove back over the hill to Hollywood. I lived on Whitley Hill, by the heart of town. And about 3 o'clock, the phone rang. 
He said, can you be here in 20 minutes? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I can be there in 20 minutes. So I got in the car, drove to Radford, uh, got on the lot, uh, and was directed up to Mr. Freeman's office, which was in the first administration building uh, just inside the lot on the, on the CBS lot. And um, the secretary said, how do you do? And I said, how do you do? She said, do you have a copy of the script? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, just a moment. And she buzzed, and she said, you make the win. And I opened the door and walked in, and I was confronted with Leonard Freeman. He said, how do you do? I said, how do you do? He shook my hand, and I shook his, and he says, please sit there. And he said, uh, uh, do you want to uh, just go ahead and read or, or what? Uh, I said, yes, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go ahead and, and read. He said, the one thing I want to tell you, uh, because I don't, want to, I don't want to blitz this job, um, I don't want Lenny in a mice and men. I don't want that. And I said, okay. And I ripped. And it was just like the casting director. He sat there and stared at me, and I sat there and stared at him, and he stared at me, and I stared at him. And he said, um, you're hired. <laughs> uh, that, that never happened to me before. It's never happened to me since. That doesn't happen here. I mean, you know, people are too worried about negotiations and contracts and money and all that. Just looked at me and said, you're hired. And I said, well, thank you. And he said, no, no. It, it's, it's, no, you're hired. Uh, now, you go along, and, and we'll talk to your agent. We'll, we'll, take, we'll take care of the whole thing. And at that point, I'd been an actor for 15 years. I'd played Lenny twice on the stage. Um, I got to the door, and I've always been a very truthful person. And I turned back, and I said, Mr. Freeman? And he said, yes. I just want you to know you're wrong. What? <laughs> and I got to tell you, my life was hanging on this job uh, for me in terms of career, uh, post -factor. And he said, you were wrong. It wasn't that you didn't want Lenny. You didn't want Ron Cheney Jr. And he looked at me, and he looked at me, and he said, you're right. I said, thank you, guys. And I walked out of the door, and I said goodbye to the secretary, and I was terrified. You know, it was a difficult role, and I was truly terrified. And I walked out, and there were wooden uh, floors there, and wooden stairs in this old building, this old, old Republic lot building. And I walked down to the stairway, which was a, you know, back and forth like this, wide stairs, like, like some of you may remember in old schools, like you know, stairways like that. And I started down the stairs. And from behind me, upstairs, and nobody's heard this story before except for my wife, I hear <laughs> and it's running. And I, and I turn around, and I, I've just gotten to the bottom of the steps. And he says, run, run. This is Mr. Freeman. And I said, yes. And I said, you know, I'm fired. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm fired. And he comes out the bottom of the stairs, and he takes me by the arm. And he said, have you done a lot of television and movie films? And I said, no, sir. I've done a fair amount, but I haven't, I haven't done tons. He said, I just want to tell you something. Don't let anyone fool with this performance. I'm telling you, you do what you want. I said, okay. He said, I mean it. I said, okay. He said, good luck, goodbye. I went back up the stairs and I went out. That has not happened to me again with a producer in Hollywood either, I promise, I promise you. Um, I got there, and for 15 years I had prepared to play Benny Up. I prepared. Um, I played, as I say, I played Lenny twice. Great role. Exquisite. An exquisite role. Steinbeck's really remarkable piece of And I knew Benny really well. I knew him very well. I was easily capable of being a five-year-old child. And there was, it was an easy thing. 
that part of it. Um, I, I have a payoff and a, 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 a climax and a new one as well, because when the show ran, about 10 weeks later, I got, in the course of one week, two letters. And they were both from uh, people with uh, mentally disabled children. And they were both handwritten. And they were both letters of thanks for me letting the world know about what they were doing. But simple and five years old. It's a gas with that show, and I have I, 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 I have no ego problems with that show. I have no ego problems because the first five years, I hear about it two or three times a week every week. Um, the next five or ten years, I hear about it two or three times a month. I still hear about it, and and it's almost always the same way. Um, You're the man with the chicken. <laughs> Um, I don't think the chicken had as good a career as <laughs> uh, That's, uh, you know, uh, you might as well get excess, and I still haven't seen any board hands up here. <laughs> Chip, did you have a question? Yeah. I, I think one of the things that's always kind of fun for people who are 5 fans is the fact that you keep seeing the same faces over and over again in different roles, and somehow you assume that either the audience isn't going to notice or they're just going to see it and they're going to accept it. When you both appeared so many times at 5 did it never occur to you that how can I go back and be a different character and still be credible because everyone who's really been watching the show has seen me do so many other things? To me, it just depends on how the, how the character was written. Yeah. And, and I took my inclination from that. And For example, um, when I did that, you know, the, the hijacker, um, when I read for it, got the part and then a couple of days later Bob Bush called me up and said Dennis I want to tell you that uh, we've cut a whole bunch of lines out of that scene and I said well I guess you're going to tell me I got cut and he said no we kept yours because you were mean and that was it you know, I mean you, you were the meanest person that read for it and want to keep your lines in there and I think a lot of it I took is, is from the the writing from the director you know, and, and just personal research uh, and, and I think part of that as you point out comes from stage training uh, for example, I, I did Russia Morn back in Hawaii and played the lead character, which you have to do several transitional changes of character within the context of the script. And so you just took that and moved it on into television. You know, you, I just, as I said, it depends on the scene, the character, the situation, and, and how it was written. And your challenge as an actor is to take those words and, and make it realistic for that character. And that's what we tried to do. I do think, though, after on Hawaii 5 because there were so many of our faces coming back, that they sort of limited us to about two shows a year because of the fact that there were just so many repetitive parts, they tried to expand the core characters or the core group of actors, and there was a limit placed on how many shows you could do. So if you did two shows, you were doing well toward the end. Um, okay. All I can tell you is I got hired to do Archie Bunkers. And I've been doing television for a hell of a long time. I was doing Mary Hartman at that particular point and, and, and other shows. And my first line in the Archie Bunker piece very early in the beginning of that. This is not all in the family. This is the, the pure Archie Bunker, uh, uh, the barroom piece. And um, you know that you know everybody's seen you because uh, they tied you on the street. <laughs> you know they know. Well, I uh, my first line was I came out of the doorway half drunk and walked over to Arch Archie Bunker and said, "Hello, Mr. Bunker. How the hell are you, huh?" <laughs> now, if uh, I if I didn't think I could get away with being a Swede. In Archie Bunker's place with people who had seen me playing Arabs. Um, um, I, played, I, I, I played just you know, East Germans, West Germans, Italians, Romanians, uh, whatever. Yeah, you believe. It's really, it really comes down to it's simple. You believe in who you're playing, um, and if the stuff's any good, um, it'll carry. The writers will carry if, if the stuff's any good. One of the problems you have, it gets worse as the years go by, is if, if the characters aren't there in the script, you can only do so much, so much to make them. I mean, you can only do so much. Five of the quality of the writing was was remarkably high, I think, for the whole production. Remarkably. So, and you can't think about it. You just believe. I believe. 
I believe. I believe. I mean, that was always an interesting question when people ask you, well, what were you thinking about when you were doing it? And I, I can't tell you what I was thinking about. You know, it's like Michael Jordan. He's got to think about move my right hand to my left hand so I can dunk it. Then you're not going to be able to do it. It just sort of comes to you. It's a, a secondhand nature thing that if you've been a while, you just sort of pick up on the words and the character and, and the writing, and you go for it. You, you, you listen. I think the key to good acting is reacting, listening to what the other character is saying. And one of the things we used to have problems back in Hawaii is that you had your line. You were so focused on your line that you never listened to what the person was saying. All you were listening to your cue line. So the moment you, you know, and what happens is your facial gestures are like, you're just looking at the guy, you know, like, the guy just said, the world ended. <laughs> you know? And the key is know your lines, know your character, and listen and react to what he's saying. You know? and, and the other actor will carry you in a lot of cases help you develop the character. And I'm a load. <laughs> I've been carried by some very good actors. Very good. Any other questions? Um, All good things come to an end you know, everything goes off the air eventually. It was real sad for me when the show went off the air. What were the circumstances behind the show finally closing down in 1980? Yes. Well, I think uh, from my perspective, uh, Dad had left the show in the 10th season. And Jimmy left the year after that, and I think he started to lose that special chemistry that had been there. I think um, yesterday a lot of the questions were what made Five O special, and I think part of it was the writing, the professional of Jack Ward, and also what each individual actor brought to those characters. I think Jack Ward, his professional, which was portrayed by McGarrett, uh, Dad had the Chinese quality of love and empathy, and Zulu brought the Hawaiian soul, and Jimmy brought his impishness. You know, he, his his. Uh, I know I have some stories there with some of the jokes he played on some of the, the characters. And each individual brought that, and when you started to lose that, um, you lost what made the show special. And I think a lot of it also was Leonard Freeman and his vision of Hawaii Five and what he tried to portray. So did he make the decision? I don't think the ratings were real poor at that point, but did he just say, look, I, I think we should just... No, uh, Lenny had died in the fifth or sixth season. Yeah. And then uh, and Jack came on after that and, and had a big role in keeping the professionals. But I think... Also, um, th there's a life to to a show, and after a while, the creativity side would just sort of starts to peter away. Uh, I think it was just time. Twelve, twelve years in the NFL. That's you know, that's a really nice long career. Twelve years. That's a long run. No. It, 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 and, and it's not that, it's not that you run out of stuff. It's, it's uh, it gets tired, I guess, uh, and the people doing it get tired too, no matter how much you change. So uh, Jack Lord tired, but he's ready to just stop? I don't, I don't think he was, I don't, I don't think necessarily he was ready to stop, and I was not there in, in, the, in the last years, and I, I just don't know about, it. but I, I, on the other hand, I, this I do know. He's a gifted painter, an exceptionally gifted painter, and painting was very important to him, and painted the whole time the show was on, um, and wanted to be a painter, and started out to be a painter. So, that may be some clue too, and, and you know you don't have much of a life. Uh, you really don't have much of a life. Uh, celebrity is a terrible word, terrible, terrible word, and particularly for something like that. I mean, uh, I've seen a lot of people go hide, and I, you know there are places in town around here where people go hide for lunch, and go hide for other things, just just to get away from it. Because it, it gets to be a bit. I think in Dad's case, he wanted to uh, spend more time with the family. We hadn't seen a lot of. You know, in fact, sometimes when I was working, the only time I saw him, because he was working those yeah. 12, 14, 16 hour days. And after 10 seasons, he wanted to devote time to the family. He was uh, very concerned about you know, some charity work that he was doing at the time, he wanted to focus on that. And he just felt that it was time to move on. And I think next year, from, uh, Jimmy did an interview recently, he said he felt it was time to move on for his character. You know? So there comes a point in time where you yourself as a person, I think, like to move on to other challenges. That's key, I think that's key too. You, know, you want to move on to something else. If you're a player, you'd like to move on to another challenge, another role. Uh, you can live with somebody for a long time. But, uh, it's interesting to take a look at somebody else. Uh, very interesting. Any other questions? We've been running for about an hour now. But I think there's another panel at 2 o'clock. I think Jimmy should be here by then, you know, with Dad and Sue and some other people. You want to take a break now and go over and make more funny captions <laughs> in the exhibit room. Please feel free to do so. And uh, I want to thank you for being here because I think what a 
one other thing that made Five O special for anyone who's been on the show was the fans from all over the world who still love the show. And I think you are what also makes it special and privileged just to be part of it. To feel your warmth and your aloha uh, after all these years is still extremely touching for all of us. And I know for my father, I'm quite sure for Ron. So, that's it. Zulu's back there also to say hi.